Um, I have two jobs, well I have several jobs. Um, one of my careers is obviously in the anatomy side and the other side is in forensic anthropology and, and what we do for a living on that is really in those two words. Anthropology is the study of man, forensic means pertaining to the court. So it's the study of man for medical legal purposes, so for the court. And most of the time it's about identification. So who was the dead individual or who is the individual who's represented in these photographs or whatever it may be. So it is, uh, it's not investigative, it is for the courts. So who is this person? It's about identity and identity for the courts. So how did you get involved? Uh, uh, with that's involved? about being in the wrong place at completely the wrong time in that my, my first degree was in anatomy and at the end of my fourth year I have this pathological fear of rodents. I, I just hate mice, rats, hamsters, <laughs> things, just absolutely abhor them. And all of the research projects in anatomy involved rodents, so I just couldn't do them. It would have just been, been such a miserable year for me that I found a member of staff who was prepared to let me to do some research on bone. And so my undergraduate dissertation was on bone and then my PhD was on bone, and by that point then I was firmly entrenched in the identification arena, and uh, my first case was whilst I was doing my PhD. Where did you study? Aberdeen. Aberdeen. So I did uh, a BSc honours in human anatomy in Aberdeen University. Um, I know you also moved to London, what did you do there? I, when I finished my PhD, um, there was a job uh, opportunity for a lecturer in anatomy at uh, St Thomas's Hospital, just opposite yeah. the Houses of Parliament. And I went along there, didn't really think I had much of a chance because it was a lecturing post and i just finished my PhD. Um, but they needed a gross anatomist and the professor on the panel was Professor Michael Day who was incredibly well known for his work in paleontology. So he, he knew a lot about bone and he was obviously interested in somebody who was also interested in bone. But he needed someone who could go into the dissecting room and teach. And so his final question to me in my interview was, if I asked you to go into the dissecting room this afternoon and teach the brachial plexus, could you do it? And of course I said, well, yes. Um, and that was what got me the job. And I've used that question in, in my interview panels many times since for members of staff. Could you go into my dissecting room this afternoon and teach the brachial plexus? If you can, then you're a good gross anatomist. And so it was, it was a... He knew, I think he knew the answer before he asked the question, but it was really what sealed my, my first job, which was lecturing in human anatomy. So that seems pretty perfect. Uh, so what made you leave London and come to Dundee? I'd, I'd been in London for um, six years, and I, you know, I was born in Inverness, I was brought up on the west coast of Scotland. I'm not a big city person at heart, I'm really not. And there was a part of me wanted home, you know, the sort of salmon swimming upstream, I wanted to get back to Scotland. <laughs> And there was no doubt that being in London and the, the network that I'd made with the Metropolitan Police, with the Home Office and with the Foreign Office, um, cemented me very well for doing my job wherever I, I chose to be. And so my family and I moved back up again to Scotland. And I've never regretted doing that. But I needed that time in London because it gave me the government connections. No doubting that. So uh, you set up the unique undergraduate programme in Forensic Anthropology here at the University of Dundee. Uh, what were your reasons behind that? I was out in Kosovo, so I was doing war crimes investigations uh, with the UN, with the Foreign Office, and we'd, we'd finished the indictment site. An indictment site is an area where the evidence that you retrieve is likely to form a part of the International Criminal Court, so if it's against Milosevic or Karadzic or Mladic or, or any of these individuals who've committed crimes. 
Um, but once we'd finished the indictment sites, there was still work that needed to be done. And we thought it was a, a very good opportunity to bring students out to get experience. And because I wasn't working with a university at that time, I was working for the government, I was taking students from other people's courses. And I find myself moaning, moaning about the quality that they, you know, they, they could quote papers to me, but they didn't know their anatomy. And, and so I really got on my soapbox and started complaining that, you know, students these days don't know their anatomy. How can you be a forensic anthropologist if you don't know your anatomy? And I, it was when I was on a, going to a conference in Iceland with a senior police officer. We were doing a police conference. And obviously I, I was bending her ear far too much about it. She turned around to me and she said very firmly, you have no right to criticise other people's students if you don't try and resolve the problem yourself. And I thought, oh, she's quite right. How dare she? And I thought, no, she's, I have no right. Um, you know, if, if there is a course that teaches that anatomy, then, and there isn't, then I should be doing it. And, and that was the reason. It was the, the quality of anatomical knowledge in other students of forensic anthropology that I just didn't think was satisfactory. What are the career prospects for one of your graduating students? That's really interesting because forensic anthropology as a degree it is difficult to find a job in that field. So what we do is we make you an anatomist first of all. And in being an anatomist, you have a global skill. So that any of my staff or my students who have gone for posts, either at home or overseas, have, have been successful because they've got good gross anatomy, whole body dissection. If you come with forensic anthropology as well, you come with an extra set of skills so that many of the people who leave here are employed as anatomists but the forensic anthropology is on the side and fundamentally that, that's what I've done throughout my entire career but if you make it solely forensic anthropology I think there are only three people employed in that position in the UK one of those their, their job is in it's in jeopardy and of the other two they're in a commercial company so it's not it's not a wide field. You've got to have other strings to your bow. It seems to be really hard to get a job as a friend. Absolutely, and so it should be. Yeah. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, you are standing up in court and you are giving an opinion on a matter and your level of expert evidence may result in that person going to prison for the rest of their life. When we give evidence in Iraq, the, the outcome of that is somebody's life. So if you don't know what you're doing, if you're not fully committed to this as a career, you shouldn't be doing it. And we're in a process now, I, I think in the past, forensic anthropology in the UK has been rather lax. And it's been viewed as a, as a back door, an easy back door to get into things forensic. That's changed. So in your generation of, train, of training, that's changed. We're now in a, an accreditation process with uh, the British Association for Forensic Anthropology and our professional body is the Royal Anthropological Institute and we will accredit people. So you will have to pass examinations, you will have to have casework that shows your credibility that the police should be able to trust you. So if it was difficult before, it's become more difficult now, but at least it's be it has a recognised framework and ladder that you can hope to progress up. But it's not easy. And don't think that, you know, when you graduate at the end of fourth year, you're ready to be a forensic answer. No, you're not. You've got another five years plus before you've got enough experience under your belt to be credible to the police, to not put them down a wrong route, to not go for a miscarriage of justice. Um, all of those scary things are, are really at the end of what we do. So, as a first year forensic anthropologist... Now you want to do something else! <laughs> no, 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 no! I just want to know, um, how can I choose my career path to make myself more employable? You've got to be good. <laughs> do you know? The, the, there's no substitute for that. You've got to be good. And you've got to be better than anybody else. I have, I have a PhD student at the moment, Katrina Davis, which you won't mind me naming her because I've said this in public in front of Katrina before. And Katrina did forensic anthropology as a degree. And she decided that she wanted to come back and do a master's by research with us. She has worked and committed herself to the subject more than I've ever seen anybody else able to do. 
and because of that you go out of your way to encourage her. So she now has more forensic case expertise than many of the academics in the field in the UK because she's been involved in at least four forensic cases. Um, because she, she published two papers out of her MSc thesis, we, the university has funded the rest of her PhD because she's worth having. It's because she's shown she's got the commitment, she's got the determination to make it work. It's not going to come to you easy. If you sit back and think, I'll wait for it to happen, then you'll sit and wait for a long time. It has to be competitive, but you have to be good, which means you have to be committed. It's hard work. So hard work and hard work. Commitment are really honesty. Important. Absolute and utter honesty. It is a very small field forensic anthropology and if if you think getting up the career ladder can be serviced by by being less than professional or by being detrimental to other people in the field, you won't last. Because it really has to be about faith and trust, things that we were saying today. Yeah. So it is it is hard work and commitment. And my grandmother came from a tiny little village on the west coast called Glen Elk. She never really left there, so she, she didn't have a great view of the rest of the world. But she always said, if it's for you, it won't go past you. So if, if this is the career that is really meant to be yours, you'll find a way to make it happen. If you sit back and wait for other people to give it to you, it won't happen. You have to find it, and you have to find it in a way that you're proud to look in the mirror every morning at the face that's looking back and go, I did that properly. I did that right, I did that with the best intention. I worked as hard as I could. Maybe I didn't get it first, but you know, I couldn't have worked any harder. And I would much rather have a student that gets a 2-1, that has worked their absolute socks off to get there, than a first that got it easy. Mm -hmm. I will choose the 2-1 that worked ahead of the first any day. It's really good advice. <laughs> well, <you. laughs> hopefully it gives hope. <laughs> well, um, you're also the director of CARHIT, which is the centre for... Uh, anatomy and human identification. Yep. Um, could you tell me a bit about your work there? Um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a complex job because it involves wearing a number of hats. Um, I came to this department in 2003 when it was the Department of Anatomy and one of the first appointments I made was Professor Wilkinson who is the world's, I mean just the most amazingly talented lady in terms of facial reconstruction and forensic art and she was the best appointment um, that I could have made at that time she really was just superb and it brought it, it rose it raised the level of the human identification element of what we were doing because whilst I had the forensic anthropology what she was able to do was to bring the whole concept of face identification into into play and at that point we realized that we needed to be more than the department of anatomy we needed to be something that brought together these two areas, the human identification and the anatomy, because they're very closely linked. And so we turned that into a centre. Um, and so I lead the centre, but there are still two very distinct arms within that centre. There's the forensic human identification side and there is the anatomy side. And for me, it's the best of both worlds, because those are both my careers. So I've managed to sit at the top of that with, with two areas that I'm passionate about, the anatomy and the human ID, working together and, and interlacing with each other, which is really good. Um, so I, I teach, as you saw today, not as much as I'd like to, because I do like teaching. I don't know if I'm any good, but I like to teach. <laughs> um, I do a lot of research. Uh, so at the moment I have a share of about five and a half million pounds worth of, of research funds. So that is very time consuming because you have to keep applying for grants. 80% um, of them you won't get, but you still have to apply for them. Um, we have to publish. So I think I've already got seven papers published in 2013. So it is about constantly keeping your research going as well as your teaching. I have the administration of the department, so I have responsibility for 14 members of academic staff, five technical and scientific support. Um, we have two postdoctoral researchers. We have about 20 PhDs. There's about 40 top postgraduates and about 600 undergraduates all of which I have a responsibility for in terms of academic standards, personal care in terms of health and resources, uh, human resources I should say, uh, health and safety awareness, budgeting, uh, all the paperwork for it. 
And over and above that, I'm, I'm an active practitioner, so I do active casework as well. So can you talk a bit about your casework? Mm -hmm. uh, some of it I will. Anything that's current will be sub -judice. So I can only talk about things so I'm not in detail. To ask you about what you're currently doing. Um, I can I can give you very general overviews of current cases, but okay. to the point that you would not be able, if you looked in the media, to identify which case it is. Okay, so let's try to talk about um, maybe the most interesting case you have oh, ever worked on. You see, they're all interesting. <laughs> That's the whole point. Every single one is a puzzle, and every single one is a challenge. Um, the ones that get under our skin most are the ones that we don't solve, and th those those are not good. So I have two missing persons. Um, one was Rini McCrae and her son Andrew, who went missing in 1970. Ooh, was it 1977? I think they went missing in Inverness. Um, I, I suspect it is a murder investigation because they've never been found. Um, there is a suspect, he has never confessed, he has never been charged because there's never been sufficient evidence. Um, but there was some intelligence came to light uh, about eight years ago that the bodies may have been dumped in a quarry just outside of Inverness. And so we put together what was the largest forensic excavation that had ever been done in the history of forensic archaeology. Um, and we excavated a quarry. Uh, fortunately for us, Satellite, uh, not satellite, a uh, uh, plane photograph, aerial photograph had been taken of the quarry about two weeks before she went missing. So we knew exactly how, where we had to get the quarry back to, see if we could find her, and we didn't. And because I'm from Inverness, and I remember the case at the time, it irritates me that we didn't find her. I think that may have been what we call her primary dump site, so it's where the bodies may have been hidden first of all. But the perpetrator, I think, has gone back, picked them up, and there is a secondary dump site. And finding a secondary dump site is much more difficult because the person's had time to think about it, to conceal it. And so we may never find her. Um, and that that irritates me. We, we had a, a beautiful letter from her sister who you know, talks about the fact that her life is in a stutter because she wants her, her sister back. She wants to put her in the ground. Um, and she said, you know, my, my heart is just, you know, it, it's so disappointed because it gets raised, my expectations, every time when someone starts looking and every time my hopes get dashed. And you think, that's the really sad bit, is that there are still family, there are still friends who are affected by not finding these bodies. And often it's the missing person that is the most challenging for anyone because you've got to find the body first. We've just done another one uh, this January which was looking for the remains of Moira Anderson, who was a little girl who went missing in Coat Bridge outside Glasgow in 1957. And there was some intelligence to suggest that a grave had been open at the time and she may have been thrown in there and the deceased therefore in his coffin placed on top of her. So we were given permission by the families, uh, by the Lord Advocate, to exhume the remains. And we lifted three coffins and she wasn't there. So again, it's the disappointment of not finding the remains. Those are the ones that stick with you more than anything mm. because you've been unsuccessful. So um, through your work, you most certainly have a lot of dealings with the media. Let's say also a history cold case. I um, hated that so much. <laughs> Why did you hate it? Um, I hate everything about television. It is false. Um, making it, even watching it, I don't do an awful lot of. Um, it is a dumbing down of science, which I don't like. It is false, you know, I mean, I stood out in a field in Bulldog, which I'd never heard of, um, for an entire day, which landed up as, I think, about two seconds on a piece of film. And you think, I could have been doing something useful rather than walking around a field for an entire day in the freezing cold in Bulldog. And, and it's the fact that the, the media believe that they are the most important thing and they believe that everybody wants to be on television, which they don't. <laughs> and they genuinely don't believe you when they say you don't. But they, they came to us with the first series and we went, no, yeah, really, we're not interested in that. We don't do archaeological work. And the archaeologists will hate us, you know, they'll, they'll make voodoo dolls of us and stick pins in us. <laughs> so no, we really don't want to antagonise the archaeologists. And they approached the university with a sum of money and the university said, we really think you should do it. Um, so the university benefited from it financially and we did the first four episodes and it confirmed to me everything that I knew I would hate about it and I did hate it 
Um, and they came back and said, we want to do a second series because they had two and a half million viewers every night watching Dundee, which is huge. It really is huge. So I don't underestimate the power of the media at all, but I really hated it. And they came back for the second series and I said, no. And the university said, how much? And they told them how much. And the university said, I think you'll do the second one. And we went, no, we won't. And we, we, we eventually agreed that we said, OK, we'll do it, but only if we can film it in the summer, because we simply can't fit this around the semesters. And they dragged their heels and we ended up filming between October and February, you know, which was right in the middle of everything. And so that was the point at which I said, this will never happen again. I will not do this. And the most obvious thing for me was the reaction of the public. The public are really scary people. Because you've been in their sitting room for eight hours, they think they know you. And they think it's okay to come and sit down on a train opposite you and talk to you. And normally they would never do that, but because they recognise your face, they think they can do it. And they don't understand that, to me, they're, they're somewhat, they could be a lunatic, you know, I have no idea who they are. And uh, the, the sort of, I suppose where it really came home to me was I was down giving evidence in a paedophile case in Livingston. And I was due in court at, at half past nine the following morning, so I stayed over in a hotel. And I was checking into the hotel, and there was a woman in front of me, and she turned around and she went, I know your face from somewhere. And I thought, oh, God, you know, is this what people have to put up with? And she said, oh, I know, she said, you work in Matalan. And she'd obviously thought she knew my face, and the only place she could think about it was that I probably worked in Matalan. So I had the most wonderful 20 minutes of spoof talking to this poor woman. I'd managed to convince her that I worked in the big pants section. <laughs> of Matalan and we had the most wonderful conversation about large ladies underwear at Matalan now somewhere along the line that poor woman is going to look at television and go oh, did that? how dare she but I thought you know I, I don't know who you are so I'm not going to interact with you and when I went into court the following morning and I, and I stood up and I gave my, my, my pledge and um, the judge turned around to me and said didn't I see you on television last night I said, well, you know, yes, Your Honour, but that's not my real job. And I was really thrown about why he would do it. And it was afterwards when I was speaking to a lawyer a friend of mine, she said, well, the reason he did that was he needed to direct the jury that if the jury thinks you're a celebrity, they won't take you seriously. They need to know that actually that's not your job. This is your job. And I thought, that's important. Do I want to be in front of a camera more or do I want to be in the court of law more? And I want to be in the courts. I don't want to be in front of a camera. Yeah. So I have no desire to follow that sort of media intrusion route. It becomes, as far as I can see, almost a prostitution. Is that, you know, you have to do the next programme, the next programme that has to be better than the last one. And before we knew it, we'd be doing history cold case on ice whilst doing a you know, great bake-off or something. And I'm just not in that at all. I'm an academic. I'm a forensic practitioner. I've played with the media, I really don't want to be in that anymore. So another interesting case that was discussed in the media recently was the, um, was the potential identification of a um, skeleton found under a car park in Leicester. The project starts from the university's perspective when Philippa Langley from the Richard III Society approaches us and says, you know, would you like to help us with this excavation? So we then start cutting these trenches, and on the very first day, we find human remains. But of course, you would expect to find human remains on the site of the friary. So it's only when we work out where the chapter house is, where the church is, and where the choir of the church is of the Grey Friars, that we penny suddenly drops and we realise that these remains we found on the first day are right in the area of the church where we're looking for. And we find curvature of the spine and battle injuries to the head. So we then take the remains back to the University of Leicester and my academic colleagues carry out all kinds of uh, tests on them. The two key ones are the carbon-14 dating that tells us that this individual died in the late 15th century, which of course is the time of the Battle of Bosworth and Richard's death, and then the clincher that the DNA that we've extracted from the skeleton found at Greyfriars matches that of a known descendant from Richard III's sister, Anne of York. And that gives us the proof that we were looking for that these remains are indeed those of King Richard III. What do you think of the 
think about the way um, this case was presented in the media. That was very interesting. <laughs> um, obviously, Professor Wilkinson did the facial reconstruction, yes. so we knew beforehand how he was going to look. So you know, there wasn't the sort of same impact on us as, as there was in the public. Um, for the University of Leicester, it was a huge coup in terms of the media coverage. And they could have done it in a number of ways. And I think what they did well was that they realised fairly early on what they might have. And they decided that they would deal with the science first. So they kept it under wraps for quite some time. They, they let it out in the media that they found these remains, it might be. And that's enough to keep the media happy to say, but we need to go do the science. And they concentrated on the science properly, well funded, um, and it had to be incontrovertible as much as, as that was possible, given you know the sort of level of uh, information available that you know was attributable. Um, I think they gave themselves a very solid scientific footing, and then what they decided to do was to control the way in which it was released to the media. I felt it became a bit of a circus. And it became a bit of, uh, you know, leading up to the big reveal. You know, it's almost like that horrible moment on, I can't remember which television program it is, when they're eliminating people from dancing. Yeah. yeah, you know, and, you know, the next person to be thrown out is, and you go into silence until they tell you. And I got the feeling that almost they were presenting the science that way. So the DNA says that it is... Richard III, you know, <laughs> and it, it was sort of you think, oh, yeah, that bit, that bit's just a little bit tacky. But what they did with that was they they managed to address both sectors of the society because the things that we did with history cold case resonated with the public, but the scientists hated it because it didn't have the depth of science. Um, other programs, people with a scientific bent like it, but the general public won't watch it. And so what Lester did was actually they did both. They did the science that kept the scientists happy and they did the presentation that kept people that watch these dance programmes happy as well. So I think they were very clever in that regard. Okay, so what, if anything, would you have done differently? Um, they, they drew the entire presentation out for an hour like it was a lecture and I, and I felt that was almost just a bit too much. Um, but what it did do, on the other hand, was it allowed people to choose the bits that they wanted to present in the media as well. So it gave a rich sort of tapestry. The honest truth is I don't know that I would have done it, I don't think I'd have done it that way, but that means that I probably wouldn't have done it as well yeah. as they did. I think it was very well orchestrated, it was very well thought out. Um, and there's more to come, because what they, what they will do now is that there will be a big play on the reburial and you know, yeah, that whole of side of things as well. So, you know, they've, they've played a very, very good hand with the media. They've controlled it very well. The, I suppose the only thing that, that was a bit disappointing is that, wasn't it Channel, was it Channel 4? I have yeah, I think it was, it was Channel yeah. 4. Channel 4 were very restrictive um, on what could and couldn't be done. So that Professor Wilkinson found it really quite difficult to work with Channel 4 because they were allowing, Leicester in some way was allowing the media to run the pace of it. Um, and that I think was was perhaps the bit that was that was least palatable. Okay. But it was good. It was well done. <laughs> Very well done. So, what is your personal opinion about the identification of the remains as Richard III? Well, they have. <laughs> They've done everything that they can. I think it's it's a very reasonable assumption. Uh, would it stand up in a court of law? No, it wouldn't. Um, but this isn't a court of law, and there is no evidence that would allow you unequivocally to state it as him. I think they have explored every possible avenue, and it is likely, it is highly likely that it is, but you can't be certain that it is now. Because the science doesn't allow you to do that. The whole issue about identification is probability, in that you can never 100% assign identity to somebody. You can 100% exclude them, yeah. but you can't 100% confirm their identity. And I think they've gone as far as they possibly can. Um, we couldn't have done it 20 years ago, because the DNA the level of DNA sensitivity just wouldn't have been there. And the interesting thing is that we might not have been able to do it 50 years from now because apparently the two alleged ancestors that they went down, neither of those have family. So when those two individuals had died out, there would have been no DNA for yeah. comparison. So it was very much of its time. So perfect timing yeah. in that regard. Yeah.
Well, uh, in the end, could I ask you also some questions about your uh, ongoing project? Mm -hmm. um, so, within your degree program, you're using a lot of cadavers for teaching. Um, are you encouraging people to donate their bodies to science? We always have. Anatomy has always encouraged people to donate. It is, um, it's a discipline that's predicated on trust between those who need to learn and those who enable us to learn. And although we're not allowed to advertise directly, we can't take an advert out in a paper or put an advert on television, you know, to bequeath your body, <laughs> there are very subtle ways in which to do it. And it is about raising awareness. It's about letting people know that we still need cadavers. We still need people to bequeath these remains. I think there was a, a feeling in the past that you know, we've got computers and we've got textbooks, you know, what do we need this for? And I think a lot of people have felt we don't do it anymore. So we do raise a lot of awareness that says, yes, we do. We do need these cadavers. These are the kind of projects that we are using them for. These are why they're so important. And that is definitely having a positive impact on the number of bequeathals that, that come to our department. So, yes, we do positively <laughs> advertise, but not in, in a... A very overt. Well, it's it's a it's a covert way rather than overt way. So, since you seem to have such a positive attitude towards it, are you going to donate your body to science? Yes. So I carry a a an organ donor card, and my organ donor card, uh, as does my husband, as do all of my children. That's their choice, not mine, but they all do, and they will all. They're all organ donors. I will probably remain an organ donor till 60, 65 ish, beyond which probably my organs will be no use to anyone, let alone to myself. And at that point, I will sign bequeathal forms. Um, depending how long it takes before uh, you know my time comes, it might be that the staff here might find it rather distressing and uncomfortable, under which circumstances my body would go to another anatomy department. But I would have no problems at all and would, in fact, you know, welcome becoming a silent teacher in Dundee when the time comes. And certainly we have had members of staff, we have a family of staff who have bequeathed in here as well. So we maybe have a very different outlook from many on, on what happens to you after you die. And I don't think it's a, a clinical outlook, I don't think it's, a, it's cold and unfeeling, I think it's a very practical outlook on life. Yeah. Um, so at this university you're using a very special revolutionary method of uh, embalming. Uh, would you mind telling me a bit more about it? It's it's not new in that Walter Gratz, uh, Walter Thiel in Graz in Austria has uh, he he's been researching this since the 1970s, and so Graz in Austria have been using this approach for a very long time, and we were in a position where we wanted to refurbish our mortuary, and we wanted to look at if there was a better way or a more appropriate way for us to be preserving our remains. And so we went across to Graz and we had a look at what they were doing and were so impressed by the end product of the embalmed cadaver that we have now changed. So we no longer embalm bodies with formalin, we only embalm with teal. And it's a process whereby the, the fluid which is has a large alcohol base, um, it has some nitrous uh, sulphates in it, it has various other trace elements within it, it's pumped into the body through the vascular system so that it allows it to get to every cell and then the body is submersed. It's submersed into a tank of the fluid for about two months and then when it comes out of the tank it, it just goes on to a, it goes into a bag and body bag and is left on a, a, a racking system until we need to dissect the body. So there's no refrigeration required. The body is completely embalmed and we've not been able to grow fungus, get bacteria, get a virus out of it, it seems to be sterile. So for health and safety reasons it's incredibly good. But the most important thing about teal is the body retains its colour. And that's really important for surgical procedures. But it also retains its flexibility. So that when you look at a, a formalin body, it's stiff, you, you can't bend the fingers. But when you look at a teal body, you've got complete flexibility. So for our surgeons who want to practice knee replacements, hip replacements, shoulder replacements, you can position the body into the area in which you need to be able to practice the procedure. So for them, it has been completely revolutionary for the medical profession. 
it's not revolutionary for anatomy because Walter teal has been doing it since the 1970s, but it is unquestionably gaining a lot of focus because the alternative to formalin is fresh frozen and fresh frozen bodies don't have a long shelf life because they're going to decompose and it is a very wasteful approach to a very precious resource because you only get one procedure. So for example, we might have the surgeons come in and do a knee replacement or a hip replacement and our body then can still go into the, the teaching side and this, the medics can look at this is the normal hip, here's what happens once you put a hip replacement in and they can also see not just the normal anatomy but the procedures for the actual surgical process that's gone on. So if you like for us there's an additional level of teaching which is really really useful. Um, and nobody else in the UK is doing it yet but I suspect they will. Yeah. I, think, I think you know there, there'll be one or two that are not far behind us. So, um, last question. Um, you're currently uh, raising money for a project uh, with a campaign <laughs> called uh, Millions for More. Oh. How's your campaign going? <laughs> We're going well. Um, <laughs> the honest truth is that it was a, a mad moment when we thought we have to raise money and it's very difficult to raise money for something like a mortuary. And um, I have a, a very dear friend, uh, uh, Lady Claire Leckie, and I'd said to her, look, you know, how, how do I go about this, Claire? She's very good at marketing. She said, okay, you need to step back. You need to think about who do you know and who can you use? So who can you exploit in the network that you know? So I sort of reeled off the kind of people that I work with. She said, crime writers. Okay, she said, so how successful are crime writers? Now, I, I know Kathy Rice relatively well because she's a forensic anthropologist. And um, she writes forensic anthropology novels. And when Kathy wrote her first one, which is called Deja Dead, which is just the most <laughs> awful title, she sent me the book and she said, what do you think of it, Sue? And I thought it was awful. I thought it was absolutely <laughs> tragic, bless her. So I, I wrote back to Kathy and I said, look, Kathy, I said, it's, it's really not for me. I'm sure it'll be absolutely great, but it really isn't for me. <laughs> and she said to me at that point, she said, you know, she said, normally I'd be upset by that. But she said, given that they've just paid me a million dollar retainer to write the second one, do you know I don't care? And I thought, yeah, you're quite right not to care. And I thought, you know, there is money in crime writing. And so I went to Val McDermott and I said to Val, um, how about this? And so what we have is we have Val and nine of her friends who are all vying to raise as much money as possible. And whoever raises the most, which is Val McDermott at the moment, um, we will name the mortuary after them. So it'll become the McDermott Mortuary or whichever, you know. Um, what we can't afford to do is let Lee Child win because we can't have the child mortuary, and that would be inappropriate. <laughs> so we then started thinking, well, actually, his character is Jack Reacher, and Jack Reacher is played by Tom Cruise. So maybe we should be approaching <laughs> Tom Cruise in terms of, you know, and so it goes on. So it really is um, an ever-expanding um, project that we, we have a cookbook. <coughs> so we have the killer cookbook at the moment, um, which is all of our crime writers have provided recipes. Uh, my husband's killer margaritas is on the front page and it went out before Christmas and it has just been shortlisted for a cookery award <laughs> which is just bad, absolutely <laughs> bad uh, so that's doing very well in terms of bringing in funds and Stuart McBride has just given the rights to his children's book called Skeleton Bob and so you know that will go on raising money and it really is about stepping sideways and find there's always a way to solve the problem You've just got to be inventive about it's it. Fantastic. So we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, so, well, I wish you all the luck we're for your fun. current project. Thank you. And, um, well, thank you very much for your time. That's my pleasure. Highly appreciated. My thank pleasure. you. That's okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Them bones, them bones gonna live again. Them bones, them bones gonna walk around. Them bones, them bones gonna praise the Lord. Now hear the word of the Lord. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Them bones, them dry.